Welcome everyone to Common Ground Local News and Political Coverage. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today virtually for this special event. My name is Kelsey Sibley and I am the Program Coordinator for the Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs at the LSU Manship School of Mass Communication. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. First, only uh, panelists will be unmuted uh, for today's conversation. If you have any questions during today's conversation, you can submit those using the chat function uh, that can be found on the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. Uh, we have built in a little bit of time at the end of today's discussion for audience questions, um, but you can submit those throughout the entire panel. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Janae Slocum, who is the director at the Riley Center. Janae, you're muted. <laughs> you know, two years of pandemic, and I still leave myself muted. Um, Kelsey, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and I'd also like to thank our undergraduate student interns and graduate assistants at the Manship School. Um, they really help make uh, our events happen. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Ariel Charbonnet, our Director of Communications. Um, as Kelsey mentioned, my name is Janae Slocum and I'm the director of the Riley Center. The center at its uh, most simplest um, definition is the outreach and engagement arm of the Manship School. We, we provide uh, programming on at the intersection of mass communication and civic life. This event, Common Ground Local News and Political Coverage, led by Dr. Josh Dar, uh, an assistant pre professor here at the Manship School, is an example of exactly the kind of discussion that we like to have at the Riley Center. It analyzes the very real way that news impacts the local democratic process and particularly the importance of local reporting on national political news. Just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Dar, um, his research focuses on campaign strategy, political knowledge, partisan polarization, and local news. He holds a PhD and master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania in political science. He emphasized American politics, political communication, and methodology. His bachelor's degree is from Boston College. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Josh Dar to start our conversation. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Thank you to, to Kelsey and to uh, Janae for those introductions. Um, Sorry we couldn't have you here with us in the 63 degree Baton Rouge sunny weather. Uh, hopefully sometime soon we can make that happen. Um, but I'll just note um, my excitement to hear from these leaders, uh, leaders really in the industry of solving this, this crisis in local news. Um, I, I'm very excited to hear from them today. Um, and I'll ask them to, uh, to introduce themselves as they answer the, the questions that we've pre prepared for them today. Um, so I think I'll start uh, with with a question for Sarah Beth Berman of the American Journalism Project. Um, this entire discussion of local news and democracy depends upon local news having a, a successful and financially secure future. Um, your your organization, uh, American Journalism Project, is making lots of investments in nonprofit local news organizations. Do you think that there is a sustainable model for strengthening local news? in communities across the country? And if so, what does that model look like? Thanks so much, Josh, uh, for having me here. I'm such an admirer of Josh's work. Um, I think he's really helped the field understand how the decline of local news and the rise of polarization, the impact on the rise of polarization. And I think it, it really has added urgency to us um, who are working on this to, to address this problem. So thank you for your contributions. Um, to your question, I'll start by just pulling back for a moment and say that our starting point for answering that question is a belief that local news is a public good, meaning local news is a service that should be provided to society regardless of if profit is available. I mean, for the last century and a half, that was really not a question we had to grapple with because frankly, it was a very profitable industry. Um, for a long time, advertise, largely advertising provided a 
both a lucrative business model for those who owned newspapers and also real civic value to communities. But the rise of the internet has led to a fundamental disruption of that business model. And so now we're confronted with the question, how do we finance and sustain the future of local news? And that leads us to our perspective that there is absolutely a business model to fund the, the future of local news, but it's going to take real intentionality and, and frankly, a transformation in how the industry is oriented. And I think we're in the middle of that transformation right now. And the, the business model that we believe in, as you alluded to, Josh, is one that is fundamentally mission oriented in its orientation um, and is building out diversified revenue, lots of revenue streams that ultimately fund the journalism that our society requires. Reader, uh, calling upon readers to, to, re to read and to support local journalism, calling upon corporate sponsors to sponsor local journalism, hosting events, and finally, and I think really importantly, calling upon philanthropy to play an important role. And I know Steve Waldman's gonna wanna talk about the potential role of, of government funding as well. I mean, this isn't rocket science, but it does take really reorienting the industry so that, organ that we're building a new set of organizations that are able to build up this diversified revenue streams and provide news and information for their communities. So Josh, you, you asked through my answer to introduce ourselves, um, I lead an organization called the American Journalism Project, and we're investing in a new generation of nonprofit news organizations, um, both in helping to grow organizations that exist, but also in helping to launch new organizations in markets across the country. Thank you so much. And you're doing really important work and rolling out new projects all the time. It's really great to see. Um, so thank you for that. And to, you already sort of <laughs> teed up a, a next question for, for Steve Waldman, um, whose organization, Report for America, um, places reporters in underserved communities uh, for journalism. So could this be a model for growth through, through more philanthropy or even government investment? And also, what sort of impact do you see when you add staff uh, to areas that need it? Uh, well, excuse me. Well, first, I have to say I will not take second seat to Sarah Beth in being a Josh Dar fanboy, because I have been a, uh, a a fan of your work because I'm such a nerd about uh, about the uh, academic work in this field, and I agree totally with Sarah Beth. Beth, that your work has been really significant in part because it moves beyond the very important notion that the collapse of local news will hurt accountability reporting, which is totally true, but takes the conversation farther into asking questions about what the impact is on polarization and misinformation and things like that, that ought to be equally important parts of the conversation. Uh, Obviously, I think the answer is yes, that Report for America is a great model for uh, trying to um, address these urgent needs in communities. And the reason is that I think it solves both a kind of economic problem and a spiritual problem at the same time. There's a reason we refer to Report for America as a national service program and not just a program. And that is because in addition to certain things that can be defined, can kind of be described in economic terms, we're providing a wage subsidy and we're helping to generate sustainability. That's all true. And I'll get to that in a sec. We are also trying to convey the principle that local journalism is a public service job, a, 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 an avocation and something that is so important to the country and to communities that it's something that you talented emerging journalists should want to do because it's incredibly important and incredibly valuable to society. It's part of how we're able to get such talented people in the program is appealing not just to, you know, practical factors. This is great experience and you got a great beat and you can get a great job later on, but appealing to their sense of mission, which I think is really true. Now, the other part of it is, you know, the mechanics. So how this works 
is we have two competitions, a competition for newsrooms and for reporters. So the newsrooms have to compete to get these hotshot reporters. Uh, and they have to prove that they both have a gap and they have the capacity to edit well and things like that. We have 200 newsrooms about evenly split between for-profits and non-profits. Then there's a competition for reporters who, uh, who apply and, and hundreds and hundreds of reporters apply and it's extremely competitive. And then we match them up. We then pay half the salary in the first year, a third of the salary in the second year. And what we're doing is something that's similar to, to what American Journalism Project does is we then work with the newsrooms to help them raise half of their share. So while we're mostly known for the reporters we put in the field, we also place a lot of effort in helping the newsrooms build a sustainable business model. To, so, and the point of that is just, we want these positions to continue forever. We, don't, we, we have total confidence in the incredible impact that these reporters can have while they're there. And we got to talk about that. I guess that was actually part of your question I haven't even answered. Uh, but we don't want it to just recede and go back to the way it was as soon as the, you know, the report for money, America subsidy goes away. So in terms of the impact, since I've already talked too much, maybe we'll, we can come back to it. But, but in general, we see a tremendous impact uh, that these reporters have in part because they're going into total gaps of, of coverage. Um, so it could be, you know, I mean, the, the very obvious examples, a reporter in Eastern Kentucky who went into an area that hadn't had a full-time reporter in the big newspaper for a decade, no one was covering it. He found out that no one in the people in Eastern Kentucky were not, didn't have running drinking water, which honestly was not a big investigative story. He didn't have to work on it for six months. He showed up at the meeting where they were saying, we haven't had water for six weeks. And then he did the story and followed up and followed up. And you know, a few months later, the state legislature passed $5 million appropriation to help fix the, the water supply. So that's an example. I mean, we tend to think of you know, the impact reporting is the sort of stuff that you know, ProPublica does. Thank you, Dick Tofel. Um, but it and that's true, but it's also basic beat reporting. The basic beat reporting that is essential is just having a tremendous impact on the health of these communities. Thank you. Yeah, that's you're you're doing important work. And like you say, local journalism doesn't have to be complicated or <laughs> to be to be impactful in places where it's where it's needed. Um, and it does it does seem like having that mission first and, and prioritizing it is something that, that your organizations have in common. Um, that being said, there's these organizations exist, of course, and, and the uh, current sources are struggling as a question of, of resources, it seems like. Um, but there are maybe some things that local newsrooms can do um, to sort of help their prospects in the current in the current environment. Um, so I'll ask this question to, to Dan Kennedy of Northeastern, and I will note, there's not a requirement that you praise me or my research before you answer the question, but it, I, I won't stop you. Uh, but it's not, we didn't, that, that was not in the notes for this. Um, you are running something I admire greatly, which is this What Works project that, that is, is working its way towards being a book that I think will be widely read. Um, how can newsrooms improve both their coverage and their economic prospects uh, when they face these resource constraints that they do? Uh, hi, yes, I'm Dan Kennedy. I'm a professor of journalism at Northeastern University in Boston, where the weather is not as good as it is in Louisiana. Um, and as Josh mentioned, I'm currently working on my third book about the future of local news. And this one I'm doing in conjunction with Ellen Clegg, who is the retired editorial page editor at the Boston Globe. And um, I can go one better than praising Josh. Uh, Ellen and I recently had Josh as a guest on our weekly podcast, uh, which you can find at whatworks.news. And uh, it's available wherever you, get, wherever you get your podcast, except on Spotify. We, we pulled all our content down. Uh, because we're old and we like Neil Young and Joni Mitchell. Um, we start from an important premise, I think, and that is that um, I don't know what sort of percentage you want to put on it. We would say 
roughly half the problems facing local news organizations are the kinds of, uh, I guess you'd say, secular problems that we all know about. The, the role of technology in destroying the value of advertising, uh, the rise of Facebook and Google and all that. And those are very real problems. And I think that um, that's what we're really going to be talking about today. Uh, but the other half is the role of bad ownership, uh, corporate chains, um, hedge funds. And if you can get those owners out of the way, usually by starting anew, uh, that presents some pretty interesting possibilities for you um, as, uh, as you move forward. So let me just briefly mention three of the projects that we're looking at. We're, we're doing a total of about 10 or 12, uh, because these represent three different business models. Uh, by the way, I should say I've also encountered a few Report for America folks in my travels, and they are just really impressive young journalists. So it's, it's great that Steve is here today. First of all, let me mention the Colorado Sun, uh, founded out of the uh, ashes, you might say, of the Denver Post, which was laid low by uh, Alden Global Capital, maybe the worst newspaper owner on the planet. Uh, 22, a staff of 22, the last time I checked in with them, uh, doing very good work. The Sun is a for-profit. Uh, I don't think that we should discount the role of for-profit corporations in moving forward with local journalism. It's organized as a public benefit corporation, uh, which is largely a term of art. Uh, it does make it harder for a hedge fund owner to come in and acquire them and to, um, and, and to gut them. Uh, but it also means that they are under no obligation to use their profits when they make some uh, to enrich their owners. All of the money can go right back into uh, their journalism. Now, when the Sun started out a few years ago, uh, they believed that they would have a pretty much a three-legged stool of membership, uh, advertising and events, and COVID happened. And so what has happened with the Sun is that the advertising that they had hoped to get took a major hit. Uh, events have not been as big a business as that they were hoping, although done a lot of events on Zoom. Uh, but membership has been uh, very, very successful. And because membership has been far more successful than they had anticipated early on, they're actually on track financially. The Sun is also doing something that I've seen a number of other for-profits do, and I think it's something to keep an eye on. They use a nonprofit to raise grant money and the like to fund certain types of uh, in-depth journalism that then appears in the sun. So although the sun is entirely nonprofit, you have something of a I'm, I'm sorry, the sun is entirely for profit. You do have something of a hybrid there, giving them, you know, at best, the best of both worlds. Very briefly, a couple of others. I'm looking at the New Haven Independent, which is a for profit. I wrote about them 10 years ago, but I'm going back because they've changed quite a bit. Uh, they now have a community radio station that is doing some uh, very interesting work. Um, they get most of their money from foundations and grants. What I think is important about uh, the independent and some other successful nonprofits is that virtually all of this nonprofit money comes locally. Um, so often we hear about uh, nonprofit news organizations being given, you know, three years of runway, then they have to figure out how to make it on their own. Well, the independent has managed to convince uh, the philanthropic community in New Haven that news has to be a um, long-term investment. And it's not something that you can walk away from after three years. Uh, what, what I like to say is, well, how do you become sustainable? Uh, 
by continuing to get donations. And uh, The Independent has just been tremendously successful at this. Finally, I want to mention our smallest project, which is called the Bedford Citizen in the northern suburbs of Boston. Um, I love this project. It was started about 10 years ago by three people who were members of the League of Women Voters. Uh, they didn't like the way their corporate weekly was covering the town or wasn't covering the town. So they said, well, we're going to all these meetings anyway. Why don't we start a website? And for a number of years, the citizen continued as an all volunteer project. And as somebody who teaches journalism students, I want them all to get jobs. But nevertheless, I don't think we can rule out volunteer projects as we think about different models for local journalism. But there's a bit of an aha moment here. And that is within the last four or five years, they began raising nonprofit money. They've gotten some newsmatch money. Uh, and uh, as a result, they now have a paid part-time reporter and a paid editor. And uh, it gives them a way to think about transitioning beyond the people who are working there now, who are terrific, but they're in their 70s and they don't really know how much longer they want to do that. So anyway, there's, there's three quick ideas on um, how some of these local news projects on the ground are finding their way to some sort of sustainability. That's great, thank you. It, it, it's great to hear about all these different approaches. Um, I mean, I think our three speakers have each spoken to, to different ideas and it's, it's an all hands on deck kind of, kind of situation. Um, and I think it's one obviously that is in, interesting and important for, for academics to, to study as well. Um, and I think that academic research can be, can be a part of this qualitative, quantitative, historical, modern, business-based, a lot of different fields, including some very good economics papers are really interested in this local news question. Um, and so our next, our next question before we sort of get into more of a discussion between the, 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 our presenters is for, is for Jessica Mahone of the, of the Center for Innovation and Sustainability in Local Media at, at University of North Carolina. Um, which is sort of how can centers and researchers like, like yours um, contribute to this debate, help find solutions, who is the audience or who should be the audience for, for academic research of this kind? Uh, excuse me. Um, so yeah, I think um, first continuing some of the work we've been doing in terms of under diagnosing and understanding the scope of this problem um, that's work that, of course, has happened here at Sislam with the U.S. News Deserts database, also work such as what Phil Napoli and I did at Duke, um, which, you know, mapped out sort of the state news media infrastructure and kind of created a way of understanding that. And I think that that's useful to continue, especially as the field is trying to experiment and see, you know, where might there be bright spots, not just for purposes of problem identification. Um, I also think work such as you have done, Joanna Dunaway, um, among others, um, that provide a rationale for why this matters so much, what happens as local news declines. Um, and I think that those are all very important questions, but I think next steps and stuff that we are planning here at Sislam is to start working more directly with newsrooms to understand um, what sustainability means for them, how it um, is probably more than just revenue and how that can be different for different kinds of newsrooms, um, engaging with newsrooms on understanding the impact of their work where they are experimenting with um, new beats, um, where they're experimenting with new business models um, so that they you know, have information about what is working for them and what's not. Um, I think so much of the work moving forward is, is more practical. Um, I also um, related to that think we need to start looking a lot more at what it would take for someone to have a lifelong career in local journalism outside of a major city in particular. Um, yesterday I saw in the RQ1 newsletter um, pa a paper by Matthew Powers about the career trajectory of 
journalist in Seattle. And I think building on stuff like that to understand, you know, what is it that someone needs so they can have a career in a mid-sized city rather than that being a starting point or a stepping stone. And I think that ties in pretty directly to expanding how we think about sustainability beyond revenue. What does a newsroom need to provide in terms of operations? Um, what kind of, you know, obviously if someone isn't getting paid well enough to make rent, they're not gonna be able to stick with that job. Um, and so, um, you know, we're talking to Lion about their sustainability audit, thinking about how to use that as a research tool. And um, so I think a lot of it is just getting practical with what we do um, and making it more, um, I think, make it more accessible to newsrooms, to communities and to um, journalists themselves. Always something academics have to think about, yes. <laughs> accessibility yes. um, to ourselves, to ourselves and others. Yes. Um, so yeah, this, these were, this is a great, a great way to get us started here. Um, I just know looking for common threads between your, your answers. It's, I think everybody said sustainability, right? I think everybody said something about uh, looking for a model that, or at least multiple models, maybe it's a suite of models for local journalism that can not only have initial success, but keep going uh, in that way. Um, I guess my, my question, um, The question that it brought up in, in my mind is where does that leave us with, with sort of older newspapers, maybe the ones that were bought by the um, by these uh, hedge funds or that are sort of going on as ghosts of themselves to use Sislam's parlance, right? Um, what are we and, and whomever whomever can take this, you know, is is the future of local news these these new sources built from the ashes of the old ones, or is there a way to sort of capitalize and rest back the the leading you know the, the leadership and the the connections that already exist with the the uh the media organizations that still exist um steve's got his hand up and i guess works most closely with those um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to him yeah i think it's a really important question i think we've we we have tended to neglect this part of the discussion we've focused on startups for good reason but you know INN, which represents the organization of nonprofit news organizations, has about 400 members. There are, meanwhile, about 7,000 newspapers in America. And so if we don't also have a strategy for figuring out how to replant some of those newspapers back into the community, we're not going to be able to tackle this problem. And I say replant. Uh, to kind of underline something that Dan said, which is that you have all these problems of, with newspapers that are struggling in addition to just the, the straight up problems of the ad model being broken by the internet and region. In addition to that, they have the extra burden of an ownership structure that sucks whatever money out that it comes out of it and doesn't invest it back in the community. So there's a whole class of newspapers that need to be extracted from their current ownership structure. And so when I say replanting, I think there, we need a whole strategy that involves carrots and sticks and incentives and punishments that essentially takes newspapers that are part of uh, you know, chains owned by hedge funds and gets them taken over by local nonprofit organizations or co-ops or public radio stations or existing or, or, or local business people, you know, deconsolidation in effect. Now, the reality is that some of these papers are too far gone, that they, they've been gutted so much and there's too much debt and the assets that they had have been too eroded that honestly, it would be better to just start something new but that's not true for all 7,000. Like in those 7,000, I think are a couple thousand at least um, for whom if you were to replant them into a more hospitable ownership structure uh, in the hands of a community organization of some sort or a, a community buyer that they could, um, that they could get to, to, to break even and thrive. 
Not that they're going to generate 30% margins, but they could be important civic institutions. A great point. Um, and, 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 you know, like you say, 7,000, <laughs> lots to save. Um, who, uh, would anyone else like to, to comment on that? Sure, uh, Dan, and then Sarah. Beth. We've seen some promising new models for some of the larger daily newspapers, uh, some of which had come under some really uh, difficult ownership structures before their current iteration. Uh, the Boston Globe is um, owned by one of the rich people that Steve mentions. And um, although it's privately held, so you can't get a look at their books, uh, they claim to be profitable and uh, they have a very good sized newsroom. So that's been pretty promising. Philadelphia Inquirer owned by a nonprofit foundation, uh, the Lenfest Foundation. Uh, the Salt Lake Tribune and uh, now the Chicago Sun-Times are actually going nonprofit. In the, in the case of the Sun-Times, uh, in conjunction with the, um, with the public radio station out there. But these are large regional papers, which are certainly important uh, to thinking about the local news ecosystem. Uh, I'm more concerned about what's going to happen at the real community level, the small weeklies, uh, some of the small dailies uh, that are owned by the likes of Gannett and Alden by the, by the hundreds. And I have not really seen any ideas come forward to save those much smaller papers. And I think that that's something that I'd love to see, but frankly, I think that the digital startup alternative is probably more promising than trying to uh, rescue some of these moribund small community papers. I'll just chime in and say I am uh, with Dan on this, that I'm not optimistic uh, about the sort of large scale effort to save many of the legacy newspapers that are really in very, very dire straits. Um, I think that the that a new generation of digital newsrooms is the most promising way to address this at scale. That said, um, there are some interesting efforts underway. Um, we partnered with an organization that is just getting started called the National Trust for Local News on a purchase in Colorado where they purchased 23 uh, weeklies in sort of ex-urban Colorado, some of which have been around for 150 years and actually are still profitable, not very profitable. And if you run the numbers, it is clear they will not be profitable for long, but they are still profitable. The issue is, as Dan noted, there really aren't sort of good actor buyers out there. Uh, so the buyers are Alden Global, this hedge fund that is uh, gutting newsrooms. And so the National Trust for Local News is, is trying to make an effort to bring kind of uh, philanthropists and other actors together to purchase these papers and then invest in the transformation of them so that they can have a long term trajectory. We, we partnered with them to sort of learn alongside them. We, uh, we're very interested in sort of in, in what the long term potential of organization of papers like this are and what the intersection is between digital news organizations and these papers. So we helped back the purchase of, of these of of these papers. Um, as you get close to it, you see it is hard, uh, you know, transforming these organizations, making them ultimately digital so that a new generation that won't be reading things on paper will be able to consume them. Um, it, it, all, all of the dynamics are very, very challenging, which is why I, I tend to not be particularly optimistic about this as a potential intervention, but um, I'm also pleased that, that the National Trust for Local News and others are, are going at it. Well, that, that sounds like a great organization and it's, it's taking partnerships between partnerships to, yeah. to save some of these places, but it, it, it's, that's a good sign. Um, yeah, just, start, right. just very quickly, oh, the, sure. deal, the Colorado deal that uh, Sarah Beth mentions, uh, the Colorado Sun was actually mm -hmm. given an ownership stake and will be able to increase its ownership stake essentially through 
sweat equity. So here you have a digital startup essentially running a legacy print chain, which is a very interesting model. Yes, it is. Um, um, yeah, Jessica. Yeah, um, I would say I think it's got to be a mix of both and it's too early to say that it should be almost entirely digital um, or that that's the replacement necessarily. And I say that based on two pieces of research, which is, you know, kind of a flimsy rationale, but I'm going to go with it. The first is the uh, study I did with Phil Napoli about how much content newspapers are still producing relative to their makeup of their of the local news ecosystem. Um, Digital is not yet in a place where it's really um, in, a, in a place where it could truly replace that. Um, granted, we didn't necessarily look at quality of that reporting, but that's one important thing to keep in mind. And I think the other thing is the um, Project Oasis report that um, Sislin put out last year, I want to say, or the year before. And that um, that showed that most digital startups aren't in news deserts. Um, they're mostly in larger cities and fairly healthy ecosystems, for lack of a better term. And I think until we understand a lot more about what it takes to have a digital startup in a news desert, um, and how they interact with either existing local media or maybe media nearby, I think we still have to rely on, on, on both and not think about it as a, is digital the only way forward? Um, so that would just be my um, thoughts on that. Um, yeah, Sarah Beth, and then, then we'll go back to Steve. Oh, I was just going to react to two points. I think um, Jessica raises a very good point, which is the question around um, digital startups in kind of more urban areas and, and less so in rural areas. Um, I think this is a, a real puzzle for the field. Um, one, uh, th this is sort of seeing down the horizon, but um, one perspective that we're beginning to have is that um, that, that the answer is going to be the intersection of, of digital news organizations with um, more rural uh, outfits. So that was one, as, as um, Dan was saying, you know, the Colorado Sun intersection with um, the Colorado media um, papers, I think is, is one example of how that might work. But the other um, potential is that as these organizations get stronger, really building out kind of networks of newsrooms. So we've helped um, to back a project in Cleveland that's launching as a newsroom in Cleveland. But the broader ambition over time is to build a network of newsrooms that would serve Ohio in many markets, but build the infrastructure so that they could have um, shared infrastructure. So this is the long game here and really about building a, a bigger infrastructure. Um, and then the other thing I'll just say is that I think as we look at news deserts, it is, we, we've been doing a lot of research in specific markets, um, in, in, in urban markets and, and looking at um, really trying to audit the local news landscape as it is today and also trying to understand how it is that community members feel about their local news, where they're getting their information. And I think even in communities where there are still legacy institutions, they are so uh, diminished that they really can be broadly considered news deserts as well. And specifically, communities of color, I think, really feel that they are living in news deserts, um, even when they're in cities that have legacy institutions. Absolutely. No, that's, that's defining deserts and all that is, is extremely important, but it's, it's, it's very complicated environments. Um, Steve, do you still have a, an addition? Oh, muted. Uh, I'm a big fan of National Trust for Local News as well. I'm in full disclosure, a co-founder. And one of the ideas there was to try to um, especially deal with small publications and mid-market publications that were in this situation. One of the things I think you have to think about is if you're thinking about the term saving existing newspapers is, is really not the right way to look at it. 
I don't think anyone is advocating saving existing newspapers in their current form. Um, but having done a couple of startups, including a couple that failed, the hardest thing to do as a startup is to build a new brand. The second hardest thing to do is to build a new audience. And so if you can create a, a, a new entity that can, can harness the brand and the audience of an existing thing, in addition to, but without drowning or being polluted by their corrupt culture or by their actual debt, then you've got something good. So if I were doing it, I'd probably start a new thing from scratch and then buy the name and list of an existing newspaper. And then you get the best of both worlds. So when we think about these 7,000 newspapers, I don't think thinking of saving them as we know it is the right way to think about it. It's more that those 7,000 entities have tremendous assets that have been built up over many years. And if there are ways of being able to take the assets without the liabilities, it's worth, it's worth looking at. And I will just to add on to what Jessica said um, about, you know, where about the nature of nonprofit and digital startups. We just finished a round at Report for America where we made a big effort this cycle to try to improve and increase the number of uh, positions we had in rural areas. So 25% of our class this last time were slots in rural areas. Not a single one of them was a digital startup. They were all newspapers in small chains or family owned, a couple of, in some cases, big chains. That wasn't because we were discriminating against the digital startups, it's because they didn't exist. Um, so there is a real issue of the, of the digital startups being concentrated in, in urban areas. Those are very needy areas too. So it's not like I would knock any of those out, but we do need to figure out ways, as Sarah Beth said, of having the kind of the energy and new models around um, nonprofit startups to extend into rural areas as well. I'm noticing a lot of the language here in terms of helping these these communities that need it is, is you know, sometimes I feel like I get questioned for using environment, but we're talking about deserts and infrastructure and sustainability, and we're using all these terms that are used for environmental causes as well. Um, but you, when you think about how do rural areas get served? How do these areas where it's not maybe financially lucrative to, to go in there, how do they get served? It's often with government intervention, right? Like the post office has flat fees everywhere as like an equity thing. Not that's why they're not making as much money because they want to be able you want to be able to send something from here to there. So it sort of brings up um, my next question, which is something that I talk about when I teach these these courses here at Manship, talking about how government has historically subsidized the news industry and how that might be modernized. Um, what is, in your opinion, the best thing the government could do to subsidize and support local news? Would that be more financial or regulatory, or should they just stay out of it? What do, what do you think? Anybody who's interested? Well, this is Steve. I'm seating the yeah. floor to Steve on this. All right. I'm I teed up Steve. <laughs> well, I, I, I like the way you framed it because I don't think the right question is, should the government help or not? The question is, how should the, should the government help? There's been history of government helping in ways that were positive and all sorts of, his, all sorts of cases where it was negative. Um, one way of looking at this is that the, the, the one and maybe only thing that most people agree was a good government intervention was the Post Office Act of 1792. Uh, and it signed into law by George Washington. And it really was an incredibly successful piece of legislation. It, it helped create the newspaper industry of, of that time. And it was in the form of free or cut rate of discount postage. It was a massive subsidy. It would be about $40 billion a year. But so why did it work? It worked because it was completely content neutral and kind of automatic. Like the, the scurrilous Jeffersonian rags that were printing horrible things about Hamilton, they got the subsidy. And the equally scurrilous Federalist papers that were saying horrible things about Jefferson, they got the subsidy too. And, it, and the subsidy was based on uh, distance, not on content. So 
that gives a little bit of clue, which is that I think, and that this is totally, I think people, everyone's going to disagree on this, that the best model for government support is, is not actually PBS, is not actually the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, or, or let me just put it differently, is not a grant program where the government sits around and decides who to give resources to, but rather something that is a, is a baseline entitlement subsidy. So the one I like is a bill that actually exists called the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, which in its full form would essentially subsidize the buying decisions of consumers, get a subsidy based on a subscription buying or subsidizes the buying power of local businesses where they get a credit if they buy local news, uh, buy ads in a local paper um, or a payroll tax credit where the publisher has part of their decision to hire reporters subsidized. So, and what I like about those is that they are basically content neutral. Um, you know, there's some content judgments at the margins, but the heart of these things are basically content neutral. And yet it would, it creates good incentives around, um, you know, subsidizing reporting, uh, but it does not have the First Amendment, you know, issues that some other, that some other policies have. So I think it is needed. Government support is needed and that it can be done, but that you really do have to take very seriously the questions of political manipulation and interference. That's, that's not a crazy fear, like you, that you really have to take that seriously, but it shouldn't be a paralyzing fear. It shouldn't be a fear that makes you not wanna do public policy because public policy is gonna happen and it's kind of a question of who's doing it and what it's going to point toward. No, those are those are great points, and um, yeah, the history of subsidies is is long and varied, uh, but they've been there, <laughs> and so it's interesting to see where they'll where they'll go in the future. Um, who else would anyone else like to chime in on that one? Oh, well, feeding the floor completely. I will I will just note that uh, the book I assign on this Tim Cook's Governing with the News I would recommend to everyone is fantastic, not only because he was here. Um, he was in the Valley chair here at, at, at LSU uh, at the time of his death in 2006, but because he invented the courses that I now teach and I've left the, de the descriptions exactly the same because it's great. Um, so, so either take that class or, or read that book, I would highly recommend. Um, to getting back to sort of the, the marketplace for news um, in that way, and maybe a little bit back to my own research, it seems like we are not only living in this sort of transitional time for local news, we're living in kind of a boom time for national news, where it's, it's readily available everywhere and it is no longer bundled with local news in the way that it used to be, where the whole package arrives on your doorstep. And you might get the pure national AP stuff, but you get it next to the local stuff. Or you get it from a DC bureau that's translating national events into your local community's uh, trials and concerns. Um, so should local newspapers today view national news sources like the New York Times as their competition? Or can we reintegrate local and national news into a coherent product um, in the way maybe that it used to be? And if so, what does that look like? Yeah. I, di I didn't mean to applaud, although that was a good question, <laughs> worthy of applause. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think that 15 or 20 years ago, it was common for us to talk about the great unbundling and that there was no reason anymore for international, national, local news, the crossword puzzle, the obits and the school lunch menu, all to exist in one place. Um, I think that what we've seen to some extent is that there can be some success in rebundling. And I'm going to go back to the Boston Globe for a moment, which, as I said, has been quite successful um, in uh, becoming a profitable uh, newspaper once again. I use the term newspaper advisedly because they have many, many more digital subscriptions than they have print subscriptions. Now, the secret to the Globe's success is, is simple. They charge a lot. 
it's expensive to get the globe. Uh, you have to pay $30 a month for a digital subscription, which I think makes them just about the most expensive uh, regional newspaper in the country. So if you're going to charge that kind of money, I actually do think that you need to have a bundle. And uh, the Globe continues to have the best of the AP, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, in what they offer to their subscribers, along with uh, a lot of local and regional news. And essentially what they are communicating to their audience is that we know we're charging a lot of money, but we can offer one-stop shopping. You don't also then need to turn around and buy a subscription to the New York Times or the Washington Post. Of course, their most committed news consumers are going to do that anyway. But I think that for the vast majority of their subscribers, uh, the bundle that the Globe is offering is probably sufficient. And I think overall, it is a good approach because you do get exposed to national and world news alongside of the local and regional news. And I think there's just something healthy about that. It's not, it's, it's not, it's getting away from this idea that all we care about is, um, is, is national news and, and we don't care about local. Of course, the flip side of that gets into some of your research, uh, Josh, which is that um, local news consumers tend to get, uh, the, the polarization diminishes as people are exposed to less national and international news in their local newspaper. So that's the flip side of that, and that's a problem too. I guess I would argue that if you're bundling it in one package, ultimately that's healthier than splitting it off and having a large section of the community immersed in the polarization of national news and not even paying attention to local news, if that makes any sense. No, I think it does. And I, I often wonder how much of my interest in this topic is because I grew up with the Boston Globe on the table every morning. <laughs> growing up outside of Boston, it was it was quite an exemplary. And I'm finding outlying um, local paper in that way. But what about uh, sort of other communities or, or other thoughts on that? What, what, what is, is national news playing a role in, in hastening this, this crisis or can it be part of the solution? Um, so I think to state sort of the obvious, I think it depends partly on the community um, to mm -hmm. whether or not it can be effective. Some communities I think, might not react particularly well to certain national news. I, I happen to be from Northeast Tennessee. And um, I when I think about that, the community where I grew up, I think if they see the two merged, it's probably not going to be overly successful. It's going to feel like uh, it's going to quickly become the local paper is the liberal media. So, um, so I think it really depends on the community to if that strategy can necessarily be successful. That makes sense, yeah. So much about local news without local context, of course. Josh, I think if my correct in remembering that one of the findings in your research was that part of the reason why declines in local news led to more polarization is that the vacuum created by the collapse of local news was filled by national news? That's sort of where our analysis led us. Yeah, we, we, we were sort of agnostic going in if it was about loss of information or if it was about replacement, or like subtraction and replacement, as we call it. And there was not any more ballot roll off, which we were taking as sort of like, if you're leaving it blank, you don't know anything about it. So we, we sort of interpreted that as, as there's not necessarily about uh, information reduction, it's more about national news being being the replacement and thus priming partisan identity. Because um, you, can't, you can't read anything about national politics without 
being reminded of parties. You can read plenty of local news without being reminded of parties. There's a really interesting study that came out a couple months ago about about private equity ownership of newspapers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they found was that uh, the getting taken over by a private equity fund didn't necessarily lead to a huge drop in news or stories. It led to a huge drop in local stories. And those stories and the, the papers still mm -hmm. got filled with stuff. It's just the stuff that got filled with was national and wire services and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it led to, and that led to, you know, the lack of local reporting led to all the negative consequences you might expect, including lower voter turnout uh, but it probably, one would think, based on your research, it would also have led to more polarization um, if, if you're basically changing people's news diets toward national. I'll just echo that um, in a lot of our research where we've audited local news ecosystems, we're finding exactly that. And when I say audit, it's literally reading the local paper for a month, listening to the public radio, listening to the TV, reading the digital upstarts, and trying to audit how much original reporting, local original reporting is happening. And what you find is that uh, a lot of these organizations or newspapers are running national content or um, sort of uh, clickbaity content for lack of a better word, you know, top 10 cocktails kind of thing um, and not running uh, original reporting about communities. Um, I'll, Echo Jessica that I think kind of locally rooted organizations for a lot of communities is going to be very important, particularly the fact that um, trust in the media is at an all time low. And uh, we know that people trust local media more than they trust national news because it sort of confirms your reality rather than distorts it. Um, that said, there are some interesting upstarts, uh, digital upstarts that are trying to kind of approach local news from a national vantage point. Just last week, a new news organization called Capital B launched. Um, they launched with a national news desk and a local Atlanta-based news desk, and their ambition is to open in um, communities across the country over time um, and provide, you know, in Atlanta, they're providing Atlanta local news for an Atlanta audience. Um, and they're also creating a national desk in the hopes of allowing kind of local stories to inform national press, not in the hopes of taking national news and um, distort, you know, re reconfiguring it for a local audience. Um, there are several organizations that have tried this. Um, some people may be familiar with Chalkbeat, which is focused on education reporting. They're in communities across the country. They have a national desk, but the reality is that most education news uh, plays out locally. Uh, the national education system is very thin and it doesn't really matter that much. And what actually matters is what's happening in Montgomery County or um, you know, e each local community. And that's why the reporting's focused that way. Uh, and then finally, I'll just mention, um, some people may be familiar with the Marshall Project, um, which is a criminal justice focused uh, news organization. And similarly, you know, most criminal justice policy plays out at the local level. And so they're beginning a program to launch uh, local news rooms, um, news organizations that are focused on doing local criminal justice reporting for a local audience. And they're, they're launching in Cleveland this year. Yeah, no, it seems like building up local capacity in most communities might be the best option, but in, in places that can pull it off, I guess, like the, like the Globe or like some of these other places, um, maybe that would be the thing to do. Um, well, we, first of all, thank you all for all those insights. It's, it's a, a great discussion. Uh, I don't want to leave the audience out of it. We've been going for about an hour. Um, so if there are audience questions, uh, we, we are, I think, about ready to, to maybe take some of those uh, in the chat, I believe. <laughs> Sure. Um, all right, I just got one from, from Kelsey here. Um, 
A question for Dan Kennedy. Can you explain why Beat the Press went off the air so suddenly? Uh, a really essential program for local news that vanished from WGBH Boston. Uh, this person does not believe the hole was filled that was left from it. Um, well, if I told you, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to uh, take action to make sure that, uh, no. Um, well, WGBH thank is you secret. For, okay. thank, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Beat the Press was a weekly media roundtable that was on uh, GBH TV. We have dropped the W. Uh, GVH TV, oh. the big public broadcaster, for 22 years, from 1998 until into 2021, and um, and and I was uh, a regular panelist on that show. And um, last year, the, the the show came to an end. And uh, you know, all I can say is that it had a good run. 22 years is a very very long time for a public TV show. Um, there were some controversies about uh, Beat the Press that were reported by the Boston Globe in the spring of 2021. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to say you might go back and look at some of that. And I, I can't say for certain whether that had anything to do with the decision to cancel the show, but it, it might have. Um, I continue to write a weekly column for the GBH website, which I love doing. Um, I miss the show. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you do, too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, it's still w WGBH to me, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, <laughs> well, the next consultant will say, why don't you bring back the W? Because that, that's how consultants <laughs> make their money, right? Well, yeah, the nostalgia factor. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for people like me that grew up watching it. Um, all right, we have uh, another question here in the in the chat. What do the speakers think about the growing Axios model for local news? Uh, wither smart brevity uh, in local news. <laughs> I, I wrote my column about Axios local oh. recently for GBH News and um, you know, you're sending two or three people to write a daily newsletter from a large city. Uh, they've got them in Denver and uh, a few other places. We're going to get one in Boston pretty soon. Um, you know, I, I think that they may be appealing to um, maybe young, well-educated tech workers who aren't particularly connected with the news in their region. Um, they offer some substance, they offer some light stuff, things to do, um, things like that. It, it's certainly not even remotely a solution to the local news crisis. I'll just echo that I think um, the fundamental problem that we're trying to solve here is the lack of original reporting. And mm -hmm. I don't think that the solution that they're offering is going to address that problem. I do think that they can probably figure out a profitable business model, and that's great. Uh, they should go for it. Um, but but I think they'll benefit from these interventions that we're all talking about working because a lot of what these newsletters are is aggregation. So they're going to be much more profitable if there's more original news gathering mm. happening that they can aggregate. And that that gets to Jessica's research on the the over, you know, the the amount of local news that comes your newspaper still. Um, yeah, so that, that's a good point on that. Um, we have a, a question here. I heard hesitation in Jessica's voice about online news and the question of whether digital is the only way forward. Isn't that hesitation what got us in trouble in the first place 25 years ago? Local print editors may share that hesitation, but that just increases this questioner's concern. Um, so is it, I guess, is, hesitating, is it just hesitating to say that that's not the only way forward? And that can be for anyone. I'm, I'll just respond and say that I, where I have hesitation is, I think there are communities where that probably won't work for now. It could be in the future. And I think there are ways to experiment and find that out. But um, I think as of right now, we need to think about multiple paths forward and not just one way. Um, you know, I mean, there are 
issues with that as the way forward for lack of a better term. Um, I think I probably said that at some point, um, just because we do have communities that don't necessarily have broadband access. I mean, there's some practical things there, um, but you know, there are other models to try. So, but I can't say which ones I think will absolutely work without more experimentation. So that would be yeah. my response. Um, my hesitation is largely just trying to sort my words correctly in my head before I <laughs> say something I will regret. <laughs> Always a good idea. <laughs> oh. All right, another one, maybe a little more journalism focused here. Uh, 20 years ago, young green reporters often were told to cut their teeth at a small daily. Where would you tell recent grads to start their journalism careers now? Oh, sure. um, Dan. I think that the advice still holds. There were fewer of those jobs than there used to be, but uh, the groups that own small weeklies and small dailies um, continue to hire uh, young reporters. Um, my concern is that, and, and this came up earlier, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember who brought this up, but um, we really need a career path for uh, young reporters going into journalism. And it would be nice if that career path wasn't a matter of at some point making it to a national news organization or, or getting out and doing something else. Uh, ideally, you could make a career in local journalism. Um, I would point out that it's always been difficult to make a career in local journalism unless you made it to one of the large regional newspapers or television stations, then you could. But um, but in real local community journalism, always been extremely difficult, and uh, and and uh, and it's more difficult today than it's ever been. But it's not as if there was some golden past where people were able to stay 20, 30, 40 years at their uh, hometown weekly. I was speaking to a publisher of one of the big national papers and um, he cited this as a real concern that frankly it is hard to find talent because the kind of traditional path of how you found great talent and how journalists were trained up has been undercut. Um, so to your question you know, earlier about the relationship between New York Times and the local news, I think the New York Times and other papers need local news for a lot of reasons, including uh, kind of a, a talent pipeline. I also think you know, the orientation that Report for America has um, around just really promoting local news as a, a service and a worthy uh, career, I think is, is um, of great importance. Like we, we as a society need to lift up local news as um, a vital part of, of our democracy and of the health of communities and something that people should be committing their careers to or committing their dollars to. Um, and then finally, I'll just say, I think you know, that question is, fun, is ultimately what this whole sustainability question is, is about, um, which is we need, to, we need to be able to build sustainable news organizations that uh, reporters can come, come and learn. You know, there's great journalism schools that are, are, that are training journalists and they need to go out and find jobs. Um, so my answer right now would be, you know, go find one of these upstart nonprofit newsrooms and, and help them build, build their organization. That's where these folks should get started. And, you know, one of the, just one last thing to add, I agree with what the others have said is, you know, we have 300, we'll have 325 reporters in the field this year. So that's a significant number of slots that are available for people. Uh, but at the same time, we hear from especially the publications in smaller communities and rural communities that they have a hard time getting people to come there. So at the same time, the Times is having trouble getting, you know, maybe the people with enough years of experience or internships, the papers in rural areas are just having trouble getting anyone to come there at all. And so I think what that points to is an opportunity, which is that if you are a talented emerging journalist, 
and you're willing and excited to go have an adventure somewhere in another part of the country in a rural community or another community, they don't, the opportunities are there. If you if you insist on staying in you know in Boston or New York, uh, you're not going to get the kind of experience that you need in the long run, um, you know, to become a, a great journalist. And if you go to one of these rural areas, you might fall in love with it and stay. Entirely true, yeah. Um, good, I hope our journalism students are listening. Um, the, this is kind of a chicken and an egg question, but to what extent do you believe the decline in local news is that there's a decline in interest in local news as national news has become more prominent and society has become more polarized. So I think this is questioning the causal direction of my work, uh, but it's also sort of, um, you know, when, when you give people the choice, they tend to choose national, at least some research has shown that. Um, I don't think we're gonna make national politics substantially less interesting anytime soon. Um, so how do we, you know, is it that there's just a generational thing where as people, as, as the younger generation gets older, maybe they'll wanna turn back to local news with news about taxes and school boards, or is this kind of a fundamental shift where national politics now really occupies the center of what uh, people want to talk about? I'll, I'll take a gander at it. Even before the internet, that's how old I am, um, there was something called the New York Times effect. And, uh, and this was a measurable effect where um, the New York Times would roll out its national print edition into a new market. Mm -hmm. And um, what they found was that um, there was decreased engagement with local and regional news in areas where the New York Times came in with their, with their national edition. Uh, so this has been a problem for a long time. Um, obviously, the ease of obtaining the Times, the Post, the Wall Street Journal, or whatever you want, combined with the decline of local news organizations has only accelerated that. But, but you could see this even 20, 25 years ago. One of, the, one of the real riddles that this points to is, let's say it is true that national news is just more interesting to most people than local news, and that given if equal choice between the two, they choose national news and the local interest goes down and that hurts the local news uh, business model. It doesn't follow from that that we should have less local news. It just follows that from that that the business model doesn't work the same way as it used to. It could be that, I think this is the case, that the civic value of that local news is just as much as it ever was it's just not manifest in the form of demand that can be converted into money. And essentially that's like your classic situation of a public good where the nonprofit sector has to play a bigger role. And so, you know, I don't know the answer to the question of which comes first, but I, but I do feel like if it is the case that, oh, people are just less interested in local news, that's that's not a case for therefore society shouldn't support local news. It's probably the other way around. It's probably a case for, oh, that means the civil society has to really step in and support it because the market demand won't. This, this might be a good time to, the, the, the term public good has come up a couple of times here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it means different things. There's a cultural meaning. Uh, I really like the economic meaning because I think it helps really define the challenges that we're facing here. And one of the meanings of a public good that economists use is that you're talking about a service that benefits the public whether they pay for it or not. So for instance, the fire department is a public good because they'll come put out a fire at your house whether you have paid them or not. So therefore, we have to support them through tax money because otherwise you have the problem of free riders. Well, local news is very much the same. If you have a situation where the local newspaper 
is reporting that the mayor is taking bribes from the trash hauling company, everyone benefits from that, whether they're paying for the paper or not. And as a result of that, you need to find a way to support that, uh, even though many people are going to say, I'm going to be a free rider. I don't need to pay for that. Josh, am I correct that in your research on the Desert Sun, um, that the kind of result of uh, taking away national editorial uh, editorials over a month long period had an impact, not just at the reader level, but also at the community wide level, meaning that at the community wide level, people became mm -hmm. less polarized in their mindsets as well. Um, so our surveys were not just of readers. Um, we found that reading it was associated with with, with depolar, you know, with the slowing down polarization, basically flattening it. Whereas in the comparison community, it went up. Um, but it was not just reading it that mattered. It was how much do you know about politics and how much do you participate in politics? And that's not always necessarily associated with reading the paper. But you're probably interacting with the kind of people that that read the paper, and and so there are. Well, not just my study, but quite a few of these studies of the public goods effect of local newspapers don't just look at readers. I mean, there are very clear community-wide um, effects of, of when local newspapers either can do more local stuff or simply are stronger or survive or whatever the, the particular case may be. But I mean, you name it, I, I put this in almost everything I write, but there's this laundry list of studies now that's like, you know, when a local newspaper closes, it's more pollution. It's more uh, violations by local businesses. It's it's lower participation and you know higher polarization in our case and a couple of other good papers that look at the same same variables. Um, you can fit it all into a paragraph, and it's pretty much everything you'd want out of city government. <laughs> it works better when local news is there. Um, and I would I'll also plug Jay Hamilton's Democracy's Detectives, where he makes the very clear point that investigative journalism is one of the absolute best things you can invest in if you care about the government saving money and getting rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, um, which obviously cost everybody a lot uh, of money. So to that public goods point, the evidence is, I think, pretty clear that it's not just readers that benefit. Josh, what is the evidence at this point about whether or not the decline in local news encourages greater spread of misinformation? I so it's hard to measure geographically the spread of misinformation, I think, is, is part of the issue. I think the same dynamics that that would lead to more national news in terms of filling the void, right? Other things would fill the void. Um, there's obviously and, and Jessica has done some research on this. There are these these sort of fake algorithmic local sites, these pink slime sites um, that are mostly giving you reprinted press releases with like 2% of partisan articles woven in there just to catch you unawares when they actually hit you with one. Um, so there are people trying to actively take advantage of, of deserts and local news in that way. You know, I think tying it to misinformation is something I've, I've thought a lot about. It just comes down to how do you measure, it's easy to, to sort of measure misinformation in, in sort of a lab context, but it's harder, or even in national survey, it's harder to do it geographically of like, where do people believe this stuff? Uh, but I think that's probably something important to do as a, as a next step. I don't know, Jessica has done some, some work on this too. Um, I, so I haven't done work on that specifically, but I was gonna say, I agree with the point of that is probably what needs to be done is something, um, I think at a large enough scale that you have a geographic sense of it um, because right now that really hasn't been done. And it's, um, and I would say, I actually will add sort of um, I guess some more context about those pink sun sites. Um, what I mapped turned out to be like a quarter of what actually existed yeah. and uh, which was wild um, how quickly they grew. But I feel like I came across something not long ago that they've been particularly active um, in spreading anti-mask um, mm. stories. <laughs> I'm gonna put that in uh, scare quotes. Um, during the pandemic and um, which something I had thought about when we were talking about like, what do we do about these sites? Um, and all I came up with was like, oh, let's map them out of sheer curiosity was what are they good first doing? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And it was, um, 
what are they trying to do? Because everything we saw at that point didn't point to anything, but it had been suggested that a lot of what they exist for is to sort of spread stuff on Facebook. Um, you see something pop up with your local town name or town nickname, and you gravitate towards it for, because you might think it's from there and you circulate right. it. And so I think that's probably what's happening with those now. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I wish I could remember where I came across that. Um, I should have looked it up, but, <laughs> um, but I thought it was really fascinating because they had been pretty inactive for the most part. Um, and then all of a sudden, like, they're sharing pretty much the same stories. Right, they can kick back into, yeah. into gear when they need it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's if we could figure out how to measure it with a big enough national survey, it would be it would be interesting um, to, to, to compare those and layer those things. Um, one more here, or a couple more here, actually, some very good questions here to me in the chat. Um, are you seeing more interest in terms of funders or public figures supporting local news in an effort to fight national polarization? Like, is this something that that motivates people? I swear this didn't this didn't come from me. This is an actual question in the chat. Um, but is that a motivating factor for people? Um, I can chime in and say absolutely. I do think that that um, that the rise of polarization and the intersection between polarization and and local news is, a, is very much motivating some funders. Um, I, the sort of first generation of funders in this space were kind of traditional journalism funders who cared about capital J journalism, believed that it mattered. You know, the Knight Foundation has been a huge funder of both Report for America and, and um, American Journalism Project and many other, um, you know, pro arguably the most significant journalism funder in, in the country. Uh, and um, and over time, there are more and more kind of democracy uh, motivated funders coming into the space, people who are very concerned about the state of our democracy and are beginning to see why local journalism is an important uh, arrow in their quiver as they're trying to address these challenges. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do we unlock as much philanthropy as possible against this problem. Um, our take is that right now, in particular, philanthropy has a very important role to play as we transition the industry. Um, and I think over time, philanthropy has a sustaining role to play too, likely not as large as we build out more and more um, revenue streams. You know, we've talked a lot about these various revenue streams, building diversified revenue. That means that philanthropy can play a smaller role. But right now, I think there really is a lot of urgency to bring in more funders. Um, and the, you know, one of your opening questions, Josh, was around the work of um, the academic academic community. And I'll just say that I think that these studies that are mounting really are very important in terms of bringing more and more um, philanthropists to this issue, um, both really understanding the state of the problem and the consequences of the problem. Uh, so so uh, that's a long winded way of saying yes, I think people are motivated by this. Thank you. No, I think that's that's an interesting point, and hopefully, hopefully, I mean, whatever gets people to help. Um, so we have just a little bit more time um, here, three minutes, I would say. Uh, and so, I guess I'll call this the bowling alone question, right? Which is before the the, the crisis in local news, there was a crisis in local civic institutions and local um, what. Uh, social capital, you might say. Um, what is the relationship there? Is there a, a correlation just between hollowing out of some of these local civil society institutions um, and, and the decline in local news? Can they help to rebuild each other? Does one help to rebuild the other? What role does local civil society play either in rebuilding local news or being rebuilt by a revitalized local news? I don't know if you know if one can cause the other, but there certainly are reinforcing trends. And when you think about the the functions that traditional local news organizations played, it wasn't only accountability and practical information about who to vote for and things like that. It was also how you got to know your your yeah. neighbors. There was a social cohesion aspect of local news. Uh, you know. 
whether it's high school sports or obituaries or wedding announcements, the, the local newspapers would, would play an important part in creating an identity in a, in a community. And so I think it's very, now whether the social cohesion, you know, whether the fragmentation led to less local news or vice versa, I'm not really sure, but it is certainly the case that the decline of local news has made that worse. And that one of the things, you know, when I, when I, when I got into journalism, it was all about accountability. You know, it was all Woodward and Bernstein and, and you know, afflicting the powerful and hel helping the afflicted and, and all that, which is still a really important function of journalism. But I'm always really touched and inspired by the fact that when people apply for a report for America and they talk about why they want to do this, in addition to talking about you know, holding the powerful accountable, they also say things like, we don't know each other anymore as a people in this country, which is not a sentence that would have come out of my mouth when I was starting out in journalism. But I thought that I think that's amazing. That's a great motivation that that you know emerging local journalists want to not just uh, be muckrakers, but community makers in helping to knit together uh, residents and communities. Um, I was just trying to look up the title of it, but um, in 2016, we did a report at Pew that touched on the relationship of civic um, habits and not just things like voting, but how well, well you know your neighbors. Um, in terms of, I think we had a social capital scale that had things like being parts of um, civic groups and going to various kinds of meetings. And there was definitely a relationship and we had those behaviors um, as the direction was those behaviors to local news. Um, and so people who have exhibit more social capital were, um, they use local news more. Now that doesn't say anything about how that contributes to the decline, but I think it speaks to what Steve was saying. It's probably a reinforcing loop um, more than likely. Robert Putnam actually writes in Bowling Alone about the relationship between newspaper reading and civic involvement. Um, he there's a section in the book in which he says that attending religious services, coaching Little League, just about any measure of civic engagement that you can think of uh, correlates positively with newspaper reading. And mm -hmm. I think that news local news organizations that are going to succeed almost have to educate their audience about the importance of civic engagement and to find ways to help them do it uh, through events, through simply being present in people's lives in a way that, that local newspapers have stopped doing for the last generation as they've had to uh, cut back what they do. So yeah, I mean, I think the two absolutely go hand in hand. Excellent. Well, I think that's a great note to end on, just the, the importance of, of both of them being, you know, both how people engage in their communities and how people read about what's going on in their communities. Extremely important, maybe in some danger, but honestly, just I'm very happy to have had this conversation. There's some really great minds and great things being done to study it and to identify it and to figure out what we can do about it. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, round of uh, applause from Zoom as always. You know, choose your method. You want the little, the little emojis? You want to actually clap? Okay, we got some hands. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I really, really appreciate it and, uh, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, before everybody goes away real quick, I do want to mention we've recorded today's conversation and it will go up live on YouTube later this week uh, on the Riley Center's, or the Manship School's YouTube channel, sorry. Uh, or you can find it at lsurileycenter.com. Uh, we'll also include links to the organizations that these folks worked at or work at currently and some of the other resources that were mentioned throughout the conversation. Um, and I wanna just, before everybody goes, plug our next event at the Riley Center. Um, which will be the second episode in our racism dismantling the system uh, series. Uh, 
uh, is the customer always right discrimination faced by BIPOC consumers? And that'll be at 3.30 p.m. on Zoom. You can register for that at the Riley Center's website, lsurileycenter.com. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to get that in before everybody was gone. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Josh, for putting this amazing panel together. It was such a great conversation. Thanks, everybody.